Thank you for joining us and welcome to another WWA Access Craft Wine Spirits webinar. My name is Michael Bellello and I am your host. I am also the director of WWA Access Craft Program now in its third year and it's really grown to include the best wholesaler advisors who are experts in building craft brands. We also have several craft brand representatives who are owners, operators, and ambassadors for their startup and small production wine spirits brands. These folks are working toward national distribution and brand recognition. So whether you're a brand owner and representative, a distributor, sales professional, or industry analyst, this webinar is for you. U.S. bars and restaurants are returning uh, an important component of the ho hospitality marketplace and often are the best improving ground for craft wine spirits. So if getting on a bar or restaurant cocktail or wine program is critical to your brand success, today's panelists will definitely share some key insights for you to apply in your day-to-day -day business. Today, we are featuring two wholesaler advisors and a visionary leader from one of the hottest hospitality markets in the US. Before we get started, if you have not downloaded the second edition of the WWA Access Craft Playbook, this is a free resource that contains insights from Access Craft Council members. Please click on the link that will be added in the chat box at the end of today's webinar. Also, as you have questions, please send them to me in the chat box and we'll get them uh, answered during the Q&A portion again at the end of the webinar. All right, so let's meet our panel. Uh, with us today, we have Simone Bianconcini, is the Vice President of RNDC's The Artisan Group, referred to as TAG, and is focused on building the craft spirit side of the business. Bianconcini has been with RNDC for 25 years, where he began as a sales analyst and eventually worked into operations and other leadership roles, including area manager for Gallo Division and division manager for Brown Foreman Division. Most recently, he was the Vice President of Sales in Kentucky, and he is also a WWA Access Craft Advisory Council member. Simone, thanks for joining us today. Great to have you. We also have with us Lee Hastings, a Vice President with Moon Distributing in Arkansas. He's a leader in the wholesale wine and spirits industry in the state. Lee is a champion for innovation and technology and has worked to develop a best-in-class sales force and warehouse operation. Lee is also a WWA Access Craft Advisory Council member, and he has a keen insight for new brands. Lee, thanks for joining us. I always appreciate time with you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And I'm really excited to uh, introduce Max Goldberg. He's the co-founder of the Strategic Hospitality Group. Uh, Strategic Hospitality is a Nashville-based hospitality company founded in 2006, has created various concepts that have contributed to the fabric of the city's dining culture and a great dining culture it is. To date, the portfolio includes Merchants, the Patterson House, the Catbird Seat, the Bandbox, the Country Club at the Bandbox, uh, Bastion, uh, Henrietta Red, Locust, and recently opened Kisser. And in fact, Kisser today was named by New York Times as 50 places in the U.S. they are most excited about now. Uh, the Goldberg Brothers nomination for the 20, uh, 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019, and 2020 James Beard Foundation Award for Outstanding Restaurateur attests to the entrepreneurial drive and focus on exceptional, except, exceptional customer service within each of their establishments. Max, a pleasure to have you with us today, and I know you're going to contribute a lot uh, to this conversation. All right, before we get started, uh, let's start with some SIP source data. Uh, to level set on the current condition with the on-premise marketplace. So the on-premise is poised to have a better second half than it did in the first half, uh, but it's still about strategic engagement. And that means understanding the role the wholesaler plays in getting brands into bars and restaurants. And that's uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So Simone, let's start with you. How can craft brands prepare for on-premise engagement and really maximize the distribution partnership? That's a great question, Michael, and thank you for having me here. Um, your relationship with the distributor is going to be critical for your success, and uh, hopefully you've had a chance to to meet with them and their teams to, to better sort of explain the proposition that you bring to them and the opportunity that your brand presents. I will tell you that your interaction with your portfolio manager, who is usually your primary contact with the team, is going to be, again, critical for your success. They're going to be the gateway to all the resources that your distributor has. I would encourage you to make sure you you invest heavily in that relationship. You're going to get out what you put in. Being prepared when you meet with your distributor is also very important. We find uh, we are being tasked to do more with less 
every year. And one of the things that we we really don't have time to do is spend a lot of energy in onboarding and getting our teams, uh, our our uh, new brands up to speed on industry, industry jargon and subtle nuances. That information is out there and we really encourage you to do your best to understand what's going on in the market dynamics, what's going on with your industry trends, do research to understand uh, you know, the pricing dynamics maybe that would affect the category you're, category you're going into. Those are all things that as you enter your into your di distributor relationship will make you a better partner with them. I think there's also a misconcep misconception that when you become uh, listed with a distributor that your work is done. And I would actually spin that and say your work has just begun. It is incredibly important that you are available for sales meetings, that you make yourself available to ride with sales reps, leverage your distributor to make key introductions with your buyers in your market. They have those relationships and very often they're happy to make those introductions for you so that you can leverage hopefully the work that they've done in the past to, to your best success. Um, that, that's a real starting point. I think we could discuss this for hours. Is there anything specific you'd like me to highlight, Michael? No, I think that's a really good start. And I'll kick it over to Lee to add to that. So I cannot echo what's any more than what Simone is saying. He is right. Use your distributors. Um, I can say from the distributor side, one, you know, something that I can say do not do. If you're coming in the market, do not not let us know that you're in the market. If you're if you're not typically in the market, let us know where you're wanting to go, and you know we can help guide you. You know Simone talked about um, distributor ride with. Yes, ask if you can do a distributor ride with. If it's not a good time, then ask your distributor or, or in your portfolio portfolio manager where that where where they should be going so your time is used um, best while you're in the market. Um, you know, let let your distributor know what you're going to be pitching. You know, what what is your goal? We, you know, it's very much a partnership, and we want to make sure that your time is used wisely. Yeah, good insights from our uh, distribution uh, partners here, Max. Let's go to you. I mean, you own the bar shelves, the wine cellars, the racks, uh, and and really, at the end of the day, you know, you've come up with some of the uh, most compelling cocktail programs in Nashville and quite frankly, in all the U S um, you know, what are you looking for in a craft wine spirits brand before you onboard them? Yeah. Um, before I answer that question, thank you guys so much for allowing me to be here. I hate to lower the credibility of this organization by allowing me on this platform, but great to be with you guys. So thank you so much. Um, I think on our side, more than anything is we obsess over the guest experience and the quality of product. So I think the first thing for us that we look for is to ensure that the, the product itself is, is of quality. And if there's a great story behind it, that makes things even better. But I think the, the first thing is just making sure that the, the quality of whatever, whatever is being sold uh, can be reflected in what we do. You know, it's you're so kind to say those things about our company. It's it's completely the team. I'm by far the least valuable person, you know, in the company and in that regard. But our beverage directors, our bartenders, the folks that really make things happen, I had a chance to speak to them to just to make sure that I'm re reflecting what I think they would want communicated as well. And really, it's it's the quality of product and then making sure that that educational piece, um, I can't express how val valuable it is having the folks actually responsible for the product coming in and educating our beverage directors, our managers, our staff, taking the time to make sure they understand why this is a little bit more special, why this is a little bit more important and allowing us to have that information to communicate to the guests to be the best salespeople you could possibly have. When we get excited about a product, especially with the bar staff, they're going to be your best salespeople because they, they're they excited about what you're doing and it's something for them to talk about. Um, and for some of the smaller brands that maybe don't have the economies of scale um, to, for those price points that we can put in there, making sure that that they have the stories so that we can have it on it as a sipping you know, list or in, in a, a cocktail that we're able to serve. But making sure that they have that time for that educational piece is an invaluable thing for, for us on our side. Yeah, and you talk about your team, uh, an important person on your team, and I think people are, are the mixologist. Um, and, and that's one thing, Simone, I, I wanna ask you about, because I know RNDC has a team of mixologists. A lot of distributors have mixologists that work uh, within the organization to create cocktail recipes uh, that then make their way uh, to bars and restaurants. So that's a very valuable program. 
that the wholesalers uh, provide. And obviously it, it, play, it pays dividends in terms of the on-premise partnerships. But quite frankly, not a lot is known about this. So my question, Simone, is how do brands get on the radar of the uh, distributor wholesaler mixologist? Maybe we lost Simone. So I will ask the question to Max. In terms of, of mixology, what are your um, what are your mixologists when you you talk with them? It's uh, it's a collaboration. You know they're they're creating things. Some of them are quite scientific. Um, how are how are they helping you build your your cocktail program? And more importantly, when they're excited to your point about a a new uh, brand, um, what kind of what kind of goes into it? Yeah, you know, all of our cocktail lists are collaborative efforts from the staff that go to the managers and beverage director. So it's a completely collaborative um, environment. I think that on the distributor side or the product side, um, what's really meaningful is an understanding of, of what some of these bartenders and mixologists are looking for and supporting them to make sure that things that maybe aren't as interesting in the market, if it's important to the staff, that they do take that leap of faith and work with them to collaborate to ensure those can come to market. And especially during you know, times of, of COVID or supplier issues over communicating when things aren't available, because we depend on those products that we're super nerdy about our cocktails. And we take great pride of them and, and really look at them the same way that a chef does with food. And they depend on certain products. And if they're not available, finding something that is comparable and over communicating and getting ahead of it is huge. And I can speak here locally here in Nashville, there's been some different um, distributors that have, have taken staff of ours um, who are looking for that next chapter in life and actually put them into their companies. So they have a deep understanding of what's important to us. They understand how obsessed we are of the guest experience in the cocktail program. And it's been a brilliant model. I think that, that that's been really helpful on our side. We're not necessarily going to go to um, a, a distributor here and say, hey, create our cocktail list, but having folks that, that have that knowledge and will work with us um, and be great partners, it, it's a two-way street. And so um, I would say really that that's been a model here locally that that's worked really well, where some of the distributors have have given great opportunities to former staff and put them in. And, and it's just been a great dialogue. Yeah. So there's obviously a symbiotic relationship between the buyer, right? And then your mixologist. Can you talk a little bit more about that relationship? And in your opinion, who discovers more of the craft brands? Is it your buyer? Is it the mixologist? When they're going to trade shows and talking to peers, how do they how do they collaborate? How do they learn and keep you know the the best and newest stuff on your on your shelves? And I definitely think it's a it's an ongoing dialogue. I mean, it's a living, breathing organism of of conversation. Um, you know, I've I've been fortunate to go to some of the beverage shows and, and learn about product myself. Um, but really, I think the staff gets excited. It's a small little nerdy world we live in, in the in the best way I can describe it. And so I think that there is that communication. But there's definitely products that have been brought in that we hadn't heard of um, that we tried and, and the staff incorporated in and we're super excited about it. And so I, I think it's really a two-way street where I can't say there's a silver bullet to say, here's exactly what's done. But I just think that having that deep, meaningful relationship and that genuine care and, and an understanding of what really moves the needle for, for companies like ours that obsess over these cocktails and, and try to continue to improve every single day. Um, is something that that is an ongoing dialogue and, and conversation that continues to happen. Yeah. Uh, Lee, how do mixologists help the distributor kind of focus efforts and, and discover and keep the product offering um, kind of up to speed? So from the distributor side, you know, we do everything we can to work with mixologists. Um, and that, but, and I guess I'll answer, you know, at least, in, you know, what we like to see from suppliers, of course, and I'll highlight, you know, use your distributors. Of course, we can let you know where to go, where the, where the best mixologists are and who they need to talk to. But the only thing that I will add and what I will add to Max's comments, you know, and we all know, look, mixologists are busy. Usually you're, you're calling on them towards the end of the day. You might just only get 30 seconds with the mixologist. You know, something that I see that, that, or something I don't see very much, but I have seen before. If you're going in to pick some or to pitch a mixologist on your product, come in with your with with a cocktail pre mixed, so you're not having to take up their bar space to mix them a cocktail. Because usually they're going to say no, they don't have time. You know, if you could just pour them a little sample and then you're done. Like I said, you might just get 30 seconds with them. Um, but you know, and it's it's you know using that attention 
to, to the max advantage. Yeah. And as simple as that tip may seem, that's probably something that makes a difference between getting a sale and not getting a sale. So it Max, really does. yeah, yeah. Max, let's go back to you, you know, in terms of tastings and on-premise engagement, people showing up to your bars, your restaurants, what are the best practices for craft brands to set up these tastings and engage with you and your staff in a purposeful manner and not being sort of a, a nuisance or a distraction? I think we're fortunate where we've been in Nashville for, for 20 years now, um, you know, 20 for my brother, 16 for me since we partnered up. And so I think that we've, we've got a deep, meaningful relationship with most of the distributors here. And so I don't think it's ever a nuisance per se, but I will highlight just because it's top of mind that um, I, th I think education on our side is just so critical and it's just top of mind, but Ryan Moses, dear friend of mine and, and respect the hell out of what he does, um, you know, at Best Brands. They've got an incredible education program where there's an ongoing dialogue to understand, you know, why products matter, what's happening here. There, there's always an opportunity to to go to the to the actual you know distributorship and see what's happening and and have an active role there. I just think the education, that ongoing care, um, is a huge deal for for us on our side. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Simone, good to have you back. I'm going to go back to you. I was hoping you can kind of lift the veil on RNDC's mixology program. You know, that program that creates a lot of, of cocktails, um, you know, recipes that make their way to bars and restaurant scenes. And it's a really valuable program, as I stated before, and it leads to a lot of great on-premise partnerships. Uh, I know I've worked with Sly and had her on a few webinars and she's awesome. But um, in terms of, you know, not a lot's known about that. Most importantly for our audience, how do brands get on the radar and into these mixology programs? Uh, thank you for the call out for Sly. She is amazing and we're fortunate to have her. Uh, she runs our, our team of seven mixologists and she's best in class. Um, Sly's team is divided up into two parts. Uh, two folks are focused on our national account business, which is our largest customers. Those are the national chains that we all know and, and have eaten at. And it's it, what what she does in, in those accounts is direct uh, the cocktail programs with large national players. As you can imagine, for a national account to feature a drink, it needs to be available pretty much across the United States. And so what they're looking for is some uniformity, and that would be a, a product that they could find in every market where, they're, uh, where, where, they, where their outlets exist, and Sly and her team will craft a cocktail around that particular product. What is more unique is Sly has three folks that are regionally located and they are more dedicated to those smaller brands. Now, I will say there are there is a lot trying to you know fit in that funnel. And very often they're focused at the top of the funnel, the larger suppliers. But Sly and her team are are very aware of the of the trends in the market, both the macro and the micro trends. They know you know, from looking at all the insight data that they have, what's happening, you know, with the consumer, but they also have their finger on the pulse locally and know when a brand might be taking off or when a trend might be starting. And that's, I think, where our opportunity is with craft brands, because more often than not, these are going to be at least initially very focused. Uh, they're going to be hyper local or regional. And what I would encourage you to do if you're working with RNDC, obviously, is make sure that your products have been shared with Sly and sent uh, and sent to her attention. She is like an artist and uh, all mixologists are incredibly creative. They love to try the products and, and figure out what works in what cocktail. And, uh, you know, they, they uh, again, they have a lot of uh, a lot of brands that they're keeping track of, but they love it when they can play with a, something unique, something local, something very crafted. And that's what we're here to talk about. So there is an opportunity there. I will tell you that it's challenging. I think one of the opportunities, though, is you know even though uh, all large distributors have these mixology programs, I think one of the unique opportunities that a craft brand has when it's developing its sort of local uh, base is uh, really in some ways you want to win the hearts and minds and create that grassroots experience. And one of the best ways to do that is engage a lighthouse account in your market, whether that's one of Max's or or some other account that that you know has a a, a real maybe regional flair and get their bartenders or mixologists to get creative with your product and hopefully get a feature out of it. And I think uh, rather than trying to push a, a drink feature out corporately, sometimes finding that opportunity locally 
and growing it out actually might be a better a, a better fit, especially for a craft brand that's got a unique uh, a unique local flair to it. Yeah, amazing insights. Let's take it one step further, Simone, in terms of uh, engaging the on-premise. So, you know, uh, craft brands doing ride-alongs and, and, you know, engaging the on-premise marketplace, a lot has changed. Uh, we went from, you know, physical sales material and just showing up and, and doing tastings. Uh, you know, then the, the industry shuts down because of the pandemic and everyone shifts to digital. Now we seem to be shifting back to, you know, real tangible sales material and, and doing proper tastings. Uh, but learning the before and after, what are some of the best tips and tactics uh, in terms of on-premise engagement and, and setting up these tastings, and most importantly, engaging with the right people to include the mixologist? Sure, <clears throat> tastings are are going to be critical for success, obviously, because uh, you know that that uh, liquid to lips uh, concept is where you're really going to win. I think uh, I cannot caution enough that you have to understand what your local laws will allow. And, and it's not just local, but understand your federal, your state. And then in some cases, there are even counties that may have special regulations that, uh, that very specifically will detail how you can interact with your consumer. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to assume our consumer is actually the customer in the bar or restaurant. Uh, so again, I, 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 knowing that uh, there's been some of these gotchas and the TTB has never been more busy than they are today, we need to make sure that we're following the letter of the law. So I'd say, first of all, and most importantly, make sure you understand what the laws are. You can't even in some markets hand out a keychain or a koozie or even serve your product in a branded piece of glassware without potentially finding yourself uh, you know, in, in some some jeopardy. So uh, again, I can you know make sure you know what your local laws are. We have some great resources, whether it is your distributor, local wholesaler associations, local restaurant associations, those resources are all available to you. And I would highly encourage you as you're starting to engage your on-premise, especially with the idea of, of sampling, uh, that you understand what those are. Having said that, since you can't create, uh, you know, since I can't make a blanket statement about the best way to go to market with a sampling, I'd say one of the things you should look for is opportunities within your account, maybe to bring a value add to them. And one of the things I've seen that has been very successful is restaurants are looking for a way to fill seats on slower nights. And often what you might find is if your brand uh, has enough uh, opportunity maybe to offer a flight tasting that they can charge for, but could be guided by somebody associated with the brand, whether that's an ambassador or perhaps even the brand uh, you know, creator. Uh, perhaps a dinner or even a, a you know some some sort of engagement that brings a value to the restaurant will also engage the consumer and help them better understand the brand and the proposition and hopefully you know at, at the end of the experience you gain a customer um a very creative I, value proposition and i think that you know honestly if i could if i could advise anybody it would be to lean that direction versus trying to find an opportunity very often in my experience is anytime you find yourself in a situation where you're able to sample your product, especially with an in to an end consumer uh, at a venue where there is no charge for the product, it is usually not the kind of place where you're going to engage, where you're going to uh, gain loyalty or, or brand awareness. Oftentimes those sort of fundraising events, it's, it is really, um, uh, it, it's not as beneficial for the brand, perhaps, but I do think if you can figure out a way to create a, an event around your brand, whether it's a, a flight tasting, uh, a, a meal pairing, something where you can engage with the consumer, I think you'll have much greater success. Yeah. And Max, I think what, what Lee and Simone have basically spelled out for us is that you got to add value. And so my question to you is, um, what can brands do to add value to not just your establishments, but you know, many establishments uh, in terms of events and, and marketing, um, because, you know, your group seems to be very creative, very competitive on this front. Nashville, I seems like there's an event uh, almost every day. And, uh, you know, how do you, how, how can a brand add value to that from an events and, and marketing standpoint? Yeah, Nash Nashville is definitely on fire. We we feel very lucky to to be here, and I think it's a huge part of our success. Um, you know, one one of the things that that we've been doing a lot uh, over the past few years is Nashville is a very collaborative market, and with, with different chefs and different uh, folks that kind of around the country, we've been doing a lot of these pop up dinners, lunches, brunches, whatever it is. That's really a collaborative effort where we all lift each other up, 
And I know that there's been um, certain opportunities where spirits have come in and done partnerships with those pop-ups or events where 100%, uh, Simone, I agree with you about the, the legal piece of it, that, that would be a devastating blow for us if we ever tried to do something and then we got our hand slapped for it. I mean, similar to everyone else, this is our livelihood. And the last thing we want to do is, is create an issue. So making sure everything is a very black and white situation. But having those collaborative um, efforts, it, it is meaningful for us. And I think that it, it's it's a very uh, supportive community. It's Nashville is unique in that way. So in our, our particular market, finding some of those events and, and figuring out a way to partner where it makes sense and everything is being done in a black and white fashion, one would be meaningful to us to, to have those that participation occur. And two, it's just a ton of fun, um, which is, I think, a big part of why we all do what we do. Yeah, fun is uh, fun is always a good value add for sure. Uh, Lee, in in terms of um, you know bringing all this stuff to what matters most. I mean, at the end of the day, this is all it's about business, right? It's about value. Uh, so, in in theory, um, this all seems to make sense. But the one thing that can upset this opportunity is pricing and marketing or market position. So uh, what do brands need to know about pricing and market position in order to engage on premise and unlock all these opportunities? Well, of course, you have to be um, competitive um, in the market that you're in, especially with pricing. And, you know, with everything that's been going on with premiumization, everyone expects, you know, a premium product. You know, so it's being how, how can you be value conscious, but, all, but still deliver, but still deliver premium. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, the best way to do that is with education, you know, mixologists, bartenders, wait staff, you know, I've always found that they are very receptive to any, any kind of education with wine and spirits. They enjoy it. They soak it up. So, anything you can do to help bring that, you know, Max was talking about events, you know, that is a form of education, anything you can do to educate them on your product. Um, you know, whether, whether it's, whether it is a wine or a spirit, you know, talk about it, you know, what, what, what makes it what it is and why is it a premium product? Yeah. And I think we've seen that we've heard from a lot of the craft brand uh, conversations we've had is that, uh, pricing can be also, you know, can be very difficult because when you're starting off, uh, you know, your price may not be optimized, your price of production, bottling, sales, there's a lot there. And you want to obviously, you know, be a profitable business. Um, and I think market position is something that is, you know, achieved strategically. So Simone, uh, talk about that. Talk about the importance of, of pricing and strategic marketing position, really understanding the market you're going into. Yeah, I think, again, that's, uh, you know, very often the misconception is, well, you know, tequila right now is very hot. So I want to play in that that market or rosés are on fire and I want to, you know, I'm going to launch a rosé, whatever it is. Whiskey is is the category I want to be in because it's showing success. Well, very often there is a, a land rush mentality that goes on and we have a lot of people trying to get to those categories, which makes it even more competitive. So while you may see some success in a category. I think I looked at North American whiskey recently, and uh, there had been twelve percent of the category, or there had been twelve percent more growth in the category that only added three percent of the revenue in the category. So it starts. You actually start to see diminishing returns. So I think it's critically important that you understand your category inside and out. You understand your competitive set. To, to Lee's point, what's your pricing proposition? It's not an issue if you're more expensive as long as you can explain it as to why you are more expensive. We're more expensive because, you know, it's a it's a it's a a product that is actually crafted by hand. We go through an extra process, whether that's a finishing, uh, a barrel aging, uh, uh, you know, more times through the still to refine the the distillate. All of those things are part of the story that you need to be able to tell and that your sales reps need to be able to tell. And again, you know, it's that elevator uh, elevator pitch mentality. You need to be able to distill the, the story of your product down into, into bullet points because you've got a very short period of time, not only to convince your buyer to, to, to purchase the drink, but then you're going to have the exact same proposition to get the consumer to understand, you know, why is this cocktail more expensive than the one that, that I'm looking at? <clears throat> also, not a lot of $50 bottles making it on the cocktail list. You know, on-premise operators are the shrewdest 
at understanding costs down to the ounce. And you have to make sure that when you're meeting with them, that that you know you know that exactly what what their margin or markup is is, and how you fit into their cocktail strategy, whether you're a modifier or the base spirit. And again, your distributor can help you with that. There's tons of great resources available out there. But when you go into those meetings and sit down with uh, a shrewd on premise operator, if you if you don't know your ounce cost and the value you're going to bring to them. Uh, you know, for the product you're promoting, you're you're very likely not going to have success. And I would defer to to Max on that as well, because I, mean, I can only imagine, you know, for every pitch I've I've given, he's probably received 10, 10 or 20. Um, and it is highly competitive. Again, you know, as I said, we hear that these categories are on fire. And unfortunately, that just uh, creates even more uh, opportunities for other to, to others to come in it. So you have to have a very compelling proposition to to you know to get through the noise in the category. We, we try to be a for-profit company. We don't, we're not always successful, but we try, and we we do live and die by uh, our cost of goods. And so you're you're 100 spot on that that is a meaningful uh, piece of information, and the thoughtfulness that goes into it beforehand is is definitely something that I'd recommend for everyone. And I, I've had friends who've come to me with a great product and would love to be able to put them into a cocktail, but it's just too expensive for us to have it within a cocktail. And so it, it can go on a sipping list, but we have to have our percentages because that's what we live and die by. And so I think that that's, that's spot on um, with that. I will say though, that um, I do think that we've seen over the past few years, a willingness of once a, a, a restaurant group or a cocktail bar, even a specific bartender earns the trust of a consumer they're willing to pay a little bit more uh, for quality. I think that, I don't know if this has um, been everyone else's experience, but I do think that people are looking for maybe something that's a little bit more special, a little bit better. And I think they'd rather have less of a consumption at a higher price point at certain times, although that's not always the, <laughs> the case. And, you know, we we love our, our shots and our beers uh, just the same. But I do think that that there is a move where you can have these higher price cocktails or, or different spirits to try it. And, and people are looking for those uh, more than we've ever seen before. Yeah, cost of goods and inventory management, still a, uh, a sound business principle to remember when you're engaging with these businesses, because as everyone has pointed out, there is a cost and there is inventory to manage. Uh, but then there's also opportunity. Uh, just know, I, I think what we're saying is know your marketplace, know which type of on-premise account you're engaging with. Is this an on-premise account uh, that's shots and beers, or is it a special occasion restaurant? I think that would would likely uh, tailor your, your presentation, and you could smartly choose who you engage with and who you don't. And Max, to go back to your wide portfolio, um, you know, you've got, I think, uh, an occasion, it seems like, for, for almost everyone. Um, tell us about that experience. I mean, you're, you're managing quite a deck of cards. How does, how does that work? Like I, I've said, I'm the least valuable person in the company, and I, I stand by that statement. We, we've we've had a tremendous amount of fun over the past 16 years, my brother and I, um, and they've been really selfish endeavors up until uh, maybe five years ago where there were places we'd want to go. And so whatever we were into at that particular moment in our life is is what we would open. And, you know, we had a trailer park theme honky tonk. We had a chef's tasting restaurant. We had, you know, oyster bar, all these different things. And now the, the thing that I'm most excited about is, is we're really partnering with and working with people that we've known for a long time. And they, they come up with these ideas and these concepts and we're, we're lucky to be on their journey. And that's, that's what we did at Locust with Trevor, who was our second chef at the Catbird seat. And that's his restaurant that we get to be a part of the same with Juliet Henrietta Red, the same with Brian and Lane at Kisser and the same with some things that we're excited to announce soon. So our, our new theory um, which has been great is to give real equity um, to these folks and have ownership in the business. They see it as owners and not necessarily just a chef or, or, or a GM. And it's been tremendous for us. And it, we've, we've all had that fun historical experience. Where we've known each other for a long time, but now they have real equity in what it is. So I am, you know, the first person to jump in and try to wash dishes or do anything I can't support. And we certainly work, you know, 70, 80 hours a week, loving what we do, but it's been really fun empowering and watching these other folks be successful and what they're super passionate about. You know, we're, we're about to open up three restaurants in the airport next week, which is a beat I've never done. It's hours are three 30 AM to like midnight. So if you see me with bags under my eyes, it's not my eight month old baby. It's uh, the airport, but I'm um, just really excited to, to keep pushing and, and doing fun stuff in Nashville. 
Well, I think the live music in Nashville's uh, airport will will probably keep you energized. That's one of the most fun um, airports to get delayed in for sure. Uh, Max, we talked a little bit about brands that are lesser known. Uh, you may not have heard of them, uh, but then it becomes a staple product in your restaurant. Can you talk about that discovery process? Yeah, I mean, we, the Patterson House, which is our cocktail bar here in Nashville, um, was really meaningful to, to our company and I think to the city where it really pivoted, where you could have great restaurants, which which existed, obviously, but they had really great spirits, wine and beer programs. But the Patterson House really pushed it where cocktails were were needed to have a great restaurant in Nashville. And that's a complete testament to the team. I'm I'm so proud of what they did. But certain vermouths and amaros, which weren't as popular in Nashville, um, we had a great relationship with the distributors and they worked with us to bring those products in, which allowed us to push the cocktail scene in Nashville to match you know, what was happening in some other major markets. Um, and I, I'd say the same thing with Mezcal. The, those would be some things that weren't necessarily as popular here in our market that we were able to put into our cocktail program, educate folks about, um, and now we're just fly, flying through uh, in, in our different spaces. Yeah, Simone, anything to add to that? Because I think from your perspective as a distributor, uh, sometimes you come across or Sly comes across a lesser known product uh, or a modifier, and it becomes, you know, a, a superstar on a, on a mixologist, um, you know, recipe card. Uh, what do distributors, how can those brands, you know, bring value to, to distributors? And conversely, what are distributors doing to, to get some of those brands um, into the, the cocktail uh, and mixology programs at bars and restaurants nationwide? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're always uh, on the on the look for what we think would be those unique opportunities, whether it's a it's a flavor that you haven't seen before, or maybe a you know a, a process creating something unusual that we think uh, would be well served in a in a cocktail. And you know, one of the things that I guess and and maybe it came up in my brief delay when I got kicked off, but I think social media plays a big part in in this opportunity as well. And you know, it is there's a, there I see one product behind you, Michael, that I think will will succeed very well with social uh, media, and that's the Paw Paws product. Very unique flavor and proposition, delicious if you've tasted it, and and. Uh, just a really cool story. Well, that's a hard thing to 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 a hard story to to tell nationally. But I can tell you that you know, uh, using social media and creating a groundswell around that is one of the ways a product like that can really sort of get the attention of someone like myself in Kentucky or Max, you know, in in Nashville for a product that's out of Florida. And I would say that you know that's maybe one strategy to consider. I can't think of any product right now that is sort of you know one of those bartender specialty that doesn't also have a, a, a pretty strong social media following, especially in the service industry, perhaps, you know. Uh, so I would I would I would make sure you're looking at that or keeping that that sort of channel open. Um, Max, I'd, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on that, because I think there is a real opportunity, in fact, for for there to be some synergies between a product like that and then a restaurant, you know, creating a cocktail or a feature around it and, and seeing sort of how those things can be additive. Um, there are, you know, I can only imagine how many products Lee sees, uh, you know, I, I've got a new product on my desk every day in a different category, you know, whether that is a, a, a base spirit or a modifier or an RTD. I mean, there is what's amazing and fun and exciting and vibrant about this is there is so much creativity and so much opportunity. At the same time, there's got to be a way that you figure out, uh, you know, to get your product to be uh, sort of filtered through all that noise because it is easy to get lost in there. And uh, social media is just one, but I also have seen it recently be one of the most effective ways to sort of get yourself, uh, you know, shoulders above the competition. Max, anything to add to that? I, th I think it all goes back to education and awareness. Uh, I think that Simone is 100% right that if, if people are asking for certain products, we're going to carry them. We we ultimately want to give the guests what they're asking for. And, um, you know, maybe I'm a little analog living in a digital world and I've got an incredible head of marketing and social media who constantly is educating me on things. I, I heard a statistic like three times more restaurant reviews are occurring on TikTok than Yelp at this point. And so the, the the strategy of of that social media presence for sure is out there because I think it's all about education and the storytelling. I mean, 
you know, I, I can tell you that in our restaurants, we, I can tell you where the fish came from, the temperature of the water, the captain of the boat, the line it was caught on and, and the breakfast that captain had that morning. Does it change the quality of the fish? No, but it's an awesome story to tell and it just tastes a little bit different. And so I think that educating and, and allowing people to understand why a product is a little bit more special, a little bit different has been massive. You know, Fawn Weaver is a dear friend of mine from Uncle Nearest and hearing the story of what she's done in Shelbyville um, has been tremendous. I mean, it's it's just crazy to see the momentum that's happening out there with a quality product and an amazing story behind it. Um, and, and she's been brilliant on social media. And so I think that things like that certainly move the needle and uh, it just all comes down to awareness and proximity. Yeah, no doubt. Lee, anything to, to add to that? So um, I'll even take this from a little bit of a different perspective, you know, then yes, I agree with everything that is set, has been said, you know, um, one brand, you know, so one brand that, you know, comes to mind in this, in this whole conversation, and it's one that our grandparents used to drink, but it was brought back due to the on-premise, you know, the mixologist getting behind it, but old granddad, you know, I mean, look what the resurgence of that brand, and it was due to the on-premise, you know, just it's, you, you find that on every back bar, every mixologist is using it now for the base. <clears throat> yeah, we, we recently did a consumer uh, survey and the findings came back that the on-premise is still where consumers explore. They're being introduced to new brands, uh, in some cases, old classic brands, right? Uh, so that's that's certainly, I think, something to, to keep in mind. I, th I think everybody knows this, but I just want to reiterate it. It's the coolest thing in the world, and I get to see it every night, where people come in and they'll sit with our bartenders and they'll say, what are you excited about? And so again, to your point about the old granddads and, and for the folks who are listening in, I think everyone knows this, but just really appreciating and leaning into how critical it is to get the bartender support. Because I mean, even at a liquor store here, they literally had a section that they basically created of what the Patterson house was carrying 10 years ago, because it was so annoying to have to go and find everything. <laughs> that was the greatest thing in the world to me. And I hope I'm not violating a liquor law by sharing that. That's above my pay grade. But it was the coolest thing in the world that it was not far from where the Patterson House was, and they had so many people asking for it, of education of these weird products that, that are now the norm that were being served. That, to me, is the coolest full circle moment. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, I think uh, there those days are, are definitely here to stay uh, because I think the customer in, is expecting it. And they obviously enjoy it. It gets them excited, and it keeps them coming back. Uh, so without a doubt, you're doing things right. Max, something we talk about a lot, not only in the Access Craft Playbook, but on these webinars, and just kind of curious, you own a lot of different concepts. Does the RTD have any place in any of your restaurants? And what what place is that? Yeah, I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna necessarily have have that at the Patterson House or Bastion or, or Henrietta Red, but you know, we're working on a project with with Garth Brooks and Trisha Yearwood downtown where we're gonna have huge scale going through and and Absolutely. In a situation like that or in the airport or in our concessions work, I think that there's certainly a home for it, but I think it's high volume when you want to ensure the quality of product. Um, but for the smaller venues, we have the cocktail bars. I can't imagine that that will be a thing, but that's not to say that we don't sell them and do really well with them. It's just in our craft cocktail bars, it's not anything we're focused on. Yeah. So high quality, you can quick pour over ice so you can serve a customer and keep them happy. Uh, I totally get it. There's a place for that as well. We're getting some questions in um, on the group chat, so we'll go to those in, in a moment. Um, but, um, you know, I think one of the things, Max, you're, you're saying you, you've uh, clearly you've done is you sort of establish um, a place for people to explore um, not just traditional brands, old brands, but also cocktails and people are are going home and, and, and trying to replicate those cocktails. So um, in terms of staff because one of the things i think a lot of people have witnessed is that the days of customer engagement in some cases even service has waned um talk about how that's important in terms of the culture and uh you know just creating a good experience and how that parlays to a better you know brand experience when it's being offered because at the end of the day uh like at the patterson house right that's almost like being a brand ambassador for hundreds of different brands and purveyors Oh, we're totally staffed. We don't have any staffing issues. It's uh, it's great. Um, now, I mean, the reality is we've never been fully staffed. I mean, it's it's something that 
we're really lucky that I think we've created um, a culture where people realize we're not the easiest group to work with because we do take that extra time and that care. Um, it's something that that we struggled with shutting down and picking back up, especially during COVID. But now that we're we're kind of launching and you know we've got a bunch of new things opening, we're going to have to hire hundreds and hundreds of people. How do we translate that culture and that care over the next eighteen months? Um, is something we talk about every single day. But I, I do think that one thing we try to, to enforce with our previous staff and our current staff is at a place like the Patterson House, if somebody comes in and they hate gin because they got wasted in high school off gin and they said they'll never drink it again, we don't have to immediately serve them a gin drink. Like if they want that vodka drink or that bourbon drink, earn their trust and get them in this safe space where they can come in and then say, hey, I know you've said that you never drink gin. Let me try to make you a gin cocktail. And if you hate it, I'll never push it again. And we can literally change people's lives where all of a sudden they realize they like gin. So to us, that's one of the coolest things in the world that, that we try to reinforce with our staff. But um, it's it's something every day we, we have people, um, you know, we're hiring and, and in our industry, I hope to be in this industry for the rest of my career. But for some of the folks, this is a stepping stone to wherever they want to do next. And so while we have them for this little special moment, how can we create the the safest, most collaborative, supportive, financially successful job while they transition to become that architect, that lawyer, that doctor, whatever they want to do. And for those folks that want to work with us for a career, we're really fortunate. We've had people work with us for 10, 15, 16 years. Um, but it's it's a it's a living, breathing thing we we work on every single day. Yeah. No doubt that's been important to your success. And uh, I think everybody appreciates the value you place on that. All right. So let's get to some of these questions. Um, I'm going to ask the question first to the distributors, and I think we're going to probably get a different answer perhaps from Max. But the uh, the question here is from um, Lachlan Perks, and uh, Lachlan wants to know, should we just walk into accounts or should we make an appointment? Because sometimes I feel like availability is difficult at some locations, especially the good ones. It's a jump ball for Simone and Lee. <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I'll, I'll jump in and Simone, you can add to it because I'm sure that you have an opinion as well. Um, I would suggest, you know, always, always try to make an appointment. Um, but, and you know, and I made the point earlier that you might only get 30 seconds with a mixologist. And if you don't have an appointment, this is definitely the case. If you can get more than 30 seconds, you're doing pretty good. Um, that's where, you know, going in with your cocktail pre-mix just so they can try it and just have your, have your 30 second spiel ready to go, you know, but uh, always, always try to make an appointment, be respectful. And again, use your distributor to help you make an appointment. And even then it might not work because that time is so valuable. You know, a mixologist is, you know, they're, 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 they're getting ready for their day. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, that that's my suggestion, Simone. Yeah, I think I think it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If if you're making a sales call, I think you're going to have uh, probably low success. I mean, restaurants are uh, are incredibly busy, and you know, God help you if you try to go in during the service hours and 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 meet somebody. And I see it happen where at eleven thirty, a you know a, a supplier rep will show up at a bar and open a bag and put a bottle on the counter, and I just think, wow, that's that, that's that's rough because they're in the midst of service. Now, if you can go during an off time and perhaps, uh, you know, find a, an owner operator that's not, you know, busy, you may you may strike a mem uh, meeting. But in the end, most of them are going to want you to be with your distributor, especially if it comes down to discussing pricing and, and other things like that. So I would always encourage you to try to make an appointment, always try to work with your distributor on those things. Now, the flip side of that, I would say is, if you already have the placement in the account and you want to go in and do some education, you want to train the bar staff, you want to just go in and as uh, Max pointed out, maybe what you want to do is really uh, uh, deal with the gatekeepers because they're so critical in the discovery of new products. I think that's a great idea. Go in one night, maybe you know on a slow night, order a drink. If you have a bottle in the bag, talk to the bartender about it. You know, offer to buy them a drink if they're allowed to in their account. If not, you know. Uh, Try to figure out a way to get them a drink at another time. You know, developing that relationship around that product, I think, is okay. But to Lee's point, and I think, you know, uh, hopefully to support Max, don't walk into an account and hope that you can score a meeting because they, you know, on-premise operators are meeting with 20 different vendors in categories, not in 
involved in ours. You know, they've got fish purveyors, they've got, uh, you know, their, their dry goods, they've got their produce guy coming in, they've got their linen guy, they're dealing with the kid that called off work, they don't have a dishwasher, they don't, they don't want to see somebody just walk in and, and want to sit down and do a tasting ad hoc. But um, I think when it comes to engaging the bartenders, perhaps, or creating a, you know, th that ambassador in the account, uh, that that might be an opportunity for you. Maxim, what do you think? I feel like Saturday night, 8 p.m. is usually a good time to just show up. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Max sent you. Yeah, is, is that's right. Uh, and, no, I mean, I, I agree with with what you guys are saying. I, I think that uh, our most valuable commodity all of us have is time. And so being respectful of of everyone and, and making that appointment and um, I, I think is spot on. I also point out that I can't tell you how on our side, how genuinely we appreciate without violating any laws or doing anything illegal, but coming in and, and supporting what we do the same way that you want us to sell your product to the guests. It means the world when I see different folks coming in and eating in our restaurants or supporting what we do. And again, everything needs to be completely legal, but please don't ever lose sight of the fact that that we love what we do and seeing those folks in, whether it's a distributor or someone with the product and they're organically going to get that experience share because you're, you're physically in there and you're supporting what we do for a living. It means the world. And I'm a very organic, genuine guy who cherishes relationships. That's kind of where the magic special sauce happens. And, and I think it's, we all can support each other. Um, if it needs to be more formal or if there's limited time, or if you're just in the market shortly, I do think making the appointment and, and ensuring that it's respectful of whoever's responsible for that program, but just a, a simple reminder, it means the world to see butts and seats supporting what we do. And, and you know, that, that, that will never not be important to us on our side. Makes sense. We've got the questions pouring in now. Uh, Max, what is your opinion uh, and offering uh, for the non-ALK and low-ALK products? I'm really excited about them. Um, you know, we we've seen a tremendous move, and and some of it is curated internally, but with our tasting uh, menu specifically, where a lot of people don't want to be destroyed with with wine at some of these tasting experiences. Um, and I see pros and cons to both of it, but I, I would actually say our non-alcoholic beverage pairings at some of our our tasting restaurants are are really special and really really excited to see what's happening. And I do think, especially with you know, I'm I'm 40 now, and I see these these younger folks, and I think that there is a trend for having those lower alk options where they want the social component that is out there, but don't necessarily want to have the the spirited cocktails that maybe I had when I was 22 years old. Um, so I'm I'm way more excited about them than I thought I, I would be, and I I don't think they're going away. I think that you're going to see more and more of them, and I think the quality of what's being put out there will continue to improve. Yeah, Lee Simone, what's the uh, what's the opinion there on, on low and, and no elk? I agree completely. I think you know I think it just just depends on the opportunity and and the session, but I think there are some amazing uh, non elk uh, opportunities out there. Whether they are recreating an exact flavor of a cocktail that you like, you know, uh, I, you see a lot of bourbon and uh, tequila and gin offerings now, or even something that's just a, a really flavorful cocktail created, you know, by the mixologist that doesn't match maybe maybe a profile you're familiar with, um, like a shrub-based cocktail. But I think they're really uh, interesting. I think uh, more and more as people are trying to be healthy and uh, we're dining out more often, but maybe not drinking as often, having those alternatives is is very important. And I do think that we're just at the tip of, of what this category is is capable of. Um, I don't think it's going to be massive, but there is definitely something there. And I think uh, it's it's exciting to watch it because I, you know, I think too often, uh, you know, there's there's uh, there hasn't been an opportunity for somebody that was either the designated driver or, you know, those of us that had wives that were pregnant and would go out to eat and they didn't have a, you know, a fun option outside of a, you know, an unsweetened uh, iced tea for for dinner. So now I think, you know, having these these options at hand are, are, are really going to create some great uh, uh, profit for, for these restaurants because you can charge a, you know, a nice, a, a nice uh, fee for uh, a unique drink. And I think they're going to give uh, folks an outlet uh, or an opportunity to drink something other than a, you know, a, a spirit that's going to maybe leave them lot, not feeling as refreshed the next day. 
Yeah, Lee, you're pretty up on on these trends. What what do you see? Do you agree? Yeah, I, I, and Simone's last point was the point that I was going to make. It's it's an opportunity for the account. Um, you know, look the the non alk and the low alk. I think it's here to stay. We, we're all seeing, you know, on the cocktail menus, there's one or two non alk and low alk drinks, you know, being offered, and you know, everyone's jumping on that trend. And I think it's I think it's one that's going to be here for a long time. I think if you, you know, sometimes it's it's a lot easier to look at the data years later and see, you know, see the consumer was trying to tell us what they want. But I think in some cases that RTD category is showing us that consumers want maybe a, a lower proof, in this case, a vodka based cocktail. If, if uh, you know, high noon success is any indicator, there is an opportunity for a low proof, uh, you know, vodka based cocktail on a menu. And I think, uh, you know, also that better for you category, I think if you looked at the Venn diagram of the consumer that wants to drink, you know, whether it's low calorie, low carb, uh, low alcohol to no alcohol products and, and uh, you know, the ones that are strictly health conscious, you see a lot of overlap. So I, I think there's there's a tremendous opportunity out there. And I think we're just begun, beginning to mine it. Yes. And I want to uh, give a shout out to Annalisa Stockwell for a great question. That was a very good question. Um, <clears throat> talk to me, uh, we have a question here about, um, you know, what are your outlooks uh, in the rum category in, in the next, in, in the near future? Uh, what's sort of, um, what, what are we looking at with rum? So rum, rum is, rum is interesting. You know, we're not seeing it yet, but, um, you know, it's kind of poised to be, the next one that could take off. Um, so it, it's going to be real interesting to watch the next few years to see what does happen with rum. Um, you know, the sky's the limit right now. I would, I would agree with, with Lee. I mean, it, it's a tiny category right now. I think, uh, the opportunity is there. I think when you think of, of, um, you know, some of the marketing opportunities around rum based spirits, and how similar in some ways they are to tequila in regards to they come from, you know, down south. We associate them with, you know, warmer climates, vacation experiences, whatever it might be. I do think that rum is is poised to be a big category. The challenge is um, the laws around rum and the different ways they are made, uh, depending on where you're coming from. And uh, in some cases, uh, the way they can be deceptively marketed, I think, is a challenge. But I do believe that those are all things that can be overcome. I'd really be interested in Max's perspective as an on-premise operator uh, for rum. I'm a big fan of rum. I, I think that rum has consistently been a favorite of the bar staff. Um, I, I think that it definitely could take off, um, especially if there's there's momentum from the consumer side. But I I don't think there's ever not been an interest in rum. And I think there's some really interesting fun rums out there that are fun to mix with. Um, and again, speaking just for myself, I've never sold more frozen drinks in my life than I am right now. <laughs> and I do think that the opportunity from that, that scalability piece with rum is, is there as well. Um, it certainly has not exploded maybe the way that I thought it would 10 years ago when it seemed like it was really about to, to take off, but um, there, there's no indication why I think it wouldn't be um a fun next category that 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 starts to really launch. We have time. Yeah, I guess just to hammer the point, education. Yeah. All right. This is uh one more question uh for Max. Uh you talked earlier about how restaurants helped grow the Amaro category in Nashville when it wasn't doing well. What are the best selling points from a restaurant perspective that get you as a restaurant owner excited and willing to take a risk on a category? that may be lesser known or not as popular? Yeah, I think I think it goes back to what we were kind of been talking about, um, you know, through this dialogue is, is it's quality of product and education. And there there's not to say that, you know, um, if there's something that is really out there, but it will pair well in a cocktail or be exciting for the staff, there's nothing that we won't look at, um, especially, you know, with, with pushing those extremes. So I, I think when the Amaros and the Vermouths and the, the Mezcals were kind of just sitting there, the staff got excited about it and the distributor and the, the products that were available were great to be able to come into the market and work with our team. Um, but I think it comes back to a consistent theme of, of what we all talked about, of, of quality of product and education. 
that's all good insights. And we have a, um, a question here for Max. One more. On, we're going to end it. Uh, Ryan Moses wants to know if he could take you to brunch on Sunday. <laughs> always, always. The answer is always uh, yes to Ryan. Thanks. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of our programming. Uh, I want to also mention Access Live, January 29th through February 1st, 2024 at Caesars Forum, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, this is where the industry will be. Uh, this is the premier industry event, open registration. Make sure you check that out. Uh, I also want to thank everybody for the thoughtful questions, really good questions today. There's plenty we did not get to. I apologize, but we will answer these questions in the next issue of the Access Playbook, which will launch in January. So this webinar, a lot of these um, insights and tips uh, and some of your questions will be featured in that playbook. If you haven't downloaded the, the previous edition, please do so. But we're going we're gonna to freshen that one up in January and launch it at uh, Access Live in Las Vegas. I want to thank the, the panel so much for a great webinar. Thank you for your time, your insights. Uh, really great. And obviously, thank you to all of you, all of you who attended uh, live today. We really appreciate your time. We wish you all the best and have a great day.